Beginning Transmission This is the President of the United States speaking. Through the marvels of scientific advance, my voice is coming to you from a satellite circling in outer space. My message is a simple one. Through this unique means, I convey to you and to all mankind America's wish for peace on Earth and goodwill toward men everywhere. The satellite you see orbiting is called SCORE. Project SCORE stands for Signal Communications by Orbiting Relay Equipment. This was the first communication satellite in orbit and it was launched on December 18, 1958. Let's explore this in more detail and welcome to What The Math. Hello everybody and welcome to What The Math, this is episode 5 of Kerbal Space Program History of Space Flight. In this episode we're talking about Project SCORE. Now this is a really interesting project because it was the first successful mission for this type of rocket which was called Atlas rocket. And on top of that this was also the first um, communication satellite ever to be launched into space. Now we're going to talk a little bit more in detail about all of this when we actually launch the rocket. But first let's explore what this rocket was all about and why it was such a cool um, design. So Atlas rockets were actually developed by DARPA, the Defense Department, and uh, these were also meant to be ICBMs, and essentially they were meant to deliver a nuclear payload to the Soviet Union. Um, now, the interesting thing about this particular rocket, apart from its really shiny appearance, was that it was all sort of one stage. So this is actually all one stage. It has no um, decouplers anywhere, except for right here. It had two boosters, these two boosters right here, that would then decouple uh, sometime in the mid-flight and uh, only this engine would uh, basically stay with the rocket. But these two boosters would actually be dropped uh, halfway through the flight uh, and only this engine would basically take the rocket to, uh, to its orbit. Now, why did Atlas rocket use such an interesting design? Well, it's, it's actually known as stage and a half. It's not really a true one stage and it's not really a true two stage. But what would happen mid-flight is that these boosters would um, separate uh, and only this one stage would then be taken to um, to final orbit. Uh, but unfortunately, this one rocket would not be enough to lift it from um, the takeoff platform. So you needed to attach boosters for them to accelerate the rocket into its final destination. So these additional rockets were actually added to the sides right here so that the rocket would uh, be able to lift itself up and then launch into orbit. Something similar was used by the Soviets in their R-7 rockets, but their rockets were, had much bigger boosters on the sides, uh, whereas Atlas had these tiny ones, meaning that you could actually store this inside a silo underground, which is what they were used for in the first um, 10 years of uh, their existence. They basically were stored in silos and pointed at the Soviet Union. Uh, however, R-7 rockets were mainly used from uh, launch pads because they were just too wide to be stored anywhere else. Now, the other interesting thing about this design is that it used something called balloon tanks. Now, this is kind of hard to explain. Basically, these tanks are made out of really, really thin metal. In other words, if there was nothing inside, if they were completely empty, it would not be actually thick enough to support the rocket and it would just collapse on itself. It would actually just fall down and sort of uh, squish itself in, in, um, and deform itself, kind of like a molten bottle. If you ever see a bottle melting, it, this is what would happen to this rocket. It would just kind of like fall. So in order to actually maintain its shape, it always has to have pressure on the inside. So kind of like a balloon. Um, and uh, the reason why the rocket maintained its shape is because it had really highly pressurized fuel inside um, almost at all times. So in other words, without the fuel, this rocket would not be able to, you know, to stay upright and would just um, sort of implode and collapse, uh, which is a really interesting design, but uh, this was done so that uh, you could save on total weight. Because of its balloon tank, you could actually use the entire first stage and take the entire thing into orbit. So in other words, you could actually take the entire first stage to orbit, and which is why by 1958, this was actually the largest 
object in space orbiting around our planet. Um, th uh, this was approximately four tons in weight, and it was a very, very large object, and you could actually see it with naked eye um, or binoculars um, from Earth, because uh, this was a very large, very shiny rocket that was uh, quite visible in space. And except for the side boosters and uh, balloon tanks, this rocket also had these awesome Vernier engines. They're called Vernier engines uh, in this game, but they're, um, in real life they're called Vernier. And what these do is essentially they're kind of like gimbals. They uh, direct the rocket and point it toward the right direction. So they're sort of like the boosters that you use to control your ascent and to also uh, point the rocket in the in a correct direction. So instead of using fins, which this rocket doesn't have, um, they use these engines on the side that would actually uh, change its direction and make it, uh, you know, go toward the right target in, in space. And this was actually the first time they used these en engines and they were quite successful, so um, many rockets afterwards used the same type of design. Alright, so we're going to launch this rocket now, and we're going to use uh, KOS to launch it. Uh, in, in other words, we're going to simulate j exactly what happened in real life. So this rocket was the first to use completely an autonomous guidance system. So it was not controlled from um, uh, from Cape Canaveral, it was not controlled from uh, from the ground. It was actually uh, controlled by itself, and this is uh, the first time such a very accurate guidance system was used. And this is, for us, going to be KOS. And here's our atlas on the launch pad. The date is December 18, 1958, and it's almost Christmas. So the message that we'll be transmitting is actually a Christmas message from the President of the United States. Now, what I didn't mention is that this was actually a super ultra secret project. Uh, before the launch date, 53 out of 88 people that were working on this project were actually told that it has been canceled. So they were told nothing is going to work, mostly because the previous Atlas rockets actually have crashed and didn't work very well. So a lot of people were easy to, uh, easily convinced that this was canceled. And the remaining 35 people who were mostly engineers uh, were told that this was just going to be a test launch. So there was actually very, very, very few people knew of the true mission that was going, that was about to happen. That was actually, uh, you know, what was inside this particular satellite and what it, what it was actually for. And really the purpose of this whole mission was to essentially test the uh, ability of Atlas rocket to deliver payload into, um, into orbit, but also its ability to essentially deliver warheads to Soviet Union. And of course, it was also meant to test the satellites. It was also meant to test the ability to transmit messages and to also uh, communicate with uh, remote objects in space. And if this project was successful, and it was successful, um, it would actually put United States on par in terms of uh, space technology to Soviet Union, which has just launched Sputnik 2, that was quite a successful launch as well. They, they were able to deliver a scientific satellite to space and do some science, and were quite uh, proud of their achievements, but the US was about to catch up. So here comes Sunrise, and we're going to launch our rocket any second now. Now this particular design is pretty good in terms of accuracy, but except for this part. This part was actually also the same color as the rest of the rocket, but I wanted to put these extra batteries in here because this satellite actually lasted for about uh, 12 days transmitting the messages uh, and being able to communicate with Earth. And to do that, I needed to put a lot of batteries in this particular satellite. So this is exactly what you see right here. These are the battery uh, rechargeable battery packs, which will be recharged as soon as I launch my rocket. And if you actually zoom in, you'll see there's some antennas here as well, and these are actually um, amplifiers and retransmitters. So uh, what this satellite could do, it could actually receive a message from the ground and then uh, amplify it and transmit it back to the ground. Anyway, so enough talk, let's actually open our KOS. We're going to copy a file called SCORE, and this is a script written specifically for this rocket, and then we're going to launch it. And here we go, here comes the launch. Successful takeoff. We're going to disable this and just keep these two open. And look at this beauty go. So it, it was a very, very shiny, very beautiful rocket. Uh, I decided to actually separate these boosters a little bit sooner because uh, since this is Kerbal Space Program, you don't really need that much fuel to get into orbit, uh, not as much as the real um, Atlas would need. And so we are actually now just flying with only one engine. And we're going to be just fine using just one of these instead of using all three like in real life. 
All right, so as we're taking off, let's talk a little bit more about this mission. So on the day of takeoff, what are those explosions? I don't even know. Let's ignore them. Anyway, on the day of takeoff, uh, President Eisenhower actually was about to meet uh, Soviet um, ambassadors, specifically from Poland, and uh, he had a White House dinner with them. But he was going to keep this mission a secret until the success. Now, if, it, if this mission had failed, it would stay a secret. Nobody would actually know about it until years later. But as it succeeded, um, he actually interrupted the dinner and revealed the project's existence and actually told everyone, listen, we've succeeded in transmitting messages from space. We are now officially on par with the Soviet Union. And obviously, uh, he made it sound like a peaceful mission, but this also gave U.S. an opportunity to essentially uh, flex their muscles and show the U uh, Soviet Union that they were now able to deliver nuclear weapons from space, which was a pretty scary thing to think about back in those days. Now, we're doing our gravity turn automatically here, and uh, we're just going to let KOS do everything for us. But as you can see, this is actually just one stage. Not, nothing else is going to separate. So all of these parts were actually all together, which really made this rocket largest possible satellite in orbit for quite some time. It was twice as heavy as Sputnik 2, and it was essentially a very large, very shiny satellite to orbit Earth um, in 1958. All right, we're in our final stage now. We're going to wait for the circularization um, burn. And while we're waiting, so yes, so these rockets were actually not very successful, but Atlas is actually still around. It's going to be, um, oh, well, at least the newer version of Atlas, Atlas V, uh, was launched in 2002, and it's, it's going to be in service until at least to, um, 2020. So Atlas is still kind of around. It's still used to launch satellites, and this design has been obviously improved a lot, but the um, idea behind it using, you know, one single liquid uh, fuel stage is something that was so successful that has been reused for at least 50 something years now. And what's really interesting is that by 1958, um, USA was really eager to get into the space race and win it because um, by 1958, USSR has only successfully launched five objects into space, whereas in 1958, USA has launched, launched 23. And we're going to talk a lot of, um, about these objects in some of the future videos, but um, even after only a year after Sputnik, US, USA has already been um, launching so many different objects. They've, they had several projects going. They had Vanguard project, they had Explorer, they had Pilot project, and Pioneer projects. And we're going to talk about um, some of them in the future videos, but we're, I've already talked about Explorer in the previous video, and you can actually check it out in the playlist. All right, so here comes the final circularization burn, where this will take us into an elliptical orbit um, of approximately 183 kilometers uh, periapsis by um, 1481 kilometers apoapsis, but that's of course in Earth terms. In Kerbin terms, it's going to be about 69 to 70 kilometers periapsis and approximately uh, 570 kilometers apoapsis. So it, it was quite elliptical, and um, inclination here was about 30, 33 degrees. Um, and uh, it was an orbit that was meant to basically uh, stay in space for about a year or so and then come back to Earth because of the drag from the atmosphere. So it only stayed in space for about a year and then it essentially re-entered and smacked down into the ocean. All right, so I think we're done here. We have released our antennas. The presidential address has begun and Merry Christmas to everyone essentially is what he was saying. Now I'm going to close all of this and I'm going to show you what this all looks like on the map as well. So here's our orbit. Uh, it's okay. It's, I overshot a little bit. It's about 69.8 kilometers periapsis and 622 kilometers apoapsis. Not too bad. Um, but yeah, it could have been a little bit less than that. And essentially, this is what you would see from space because it was so shiny. Uh, and um, so big, you could actually see it with your naked eye. We could, you don't, you didn't even need binoculars. If you were in a dark enough location, you would see this really, really bright object moving through, um, through space in orbit, and it was pretty cool. I, I think back in the days in 1958, 59, people must have been fascinated, you know, trying to find these um, spaceships, trying to find these satellites in the sky, and it must have been really awesome time to live in because not only uh, were these uh, completely new discoveries, completely 
and new machines that were able to take us to space. But obviously there's always some fear because now this created an opportunity for extremely powerful weapons to be delivered from space in minutes. Now, the broadcast from this satellite was actually relatively weak. You needed special equipment to even detect it. Unlike Sputnik, um, this was a very, very, very weak transmitter. Sputnik you could hear from even uh, amateur um, radio uh, receivers, but this particular satellite uh, had to have a really professional one. So most people have heard the transmission from the president only on TV later on. They didn't actually hear it by themselves. But of course this mission was extremely important because essentially this is or this was the start and the beginning of the communication age because this is uh, the basis of you know things like cell phone communication smartphone communication the internet and so on um, everything now relies on these satellites that are in orbit and there's thousands and thousands of them in space um, and all of it started with this little project, or I guess not so little because it was actually very large. Um, it was about four tons in size or 4,000 kilograms or 8,000 pounds in, in mass. And it was uh, relatively long as well. This is a very large rocket. It was about 100 feet long at launch and it lost a little bit, but not much. So it was almost 30 meters long. And I think this is all I wanted to say about Project SCORE. This was essentially the beginning of an awesome era. And even though it was a rocket that was meant to destroy the world, this was also a satellite and a rocket that essentially created an opportunity for us to communicate instantly with everyone in the world. So if it wasn't for Project SCORE, who knows how long it would take for us to actually get as far as we are right now. Anyway, thank you guys so much for watching. Hopefully you enjoyed this video and hopefully you learned a little bit more about the history of spaceflight. Check out some of the other Kerbal Space Program videos I've posted and also check out some of the other history of space videos I've posted previously as well. Now we're going to actually try to re-enter using the spacecraft. I have a little bit of fuel left to initiate a, um, a re-entry and so we're going to try to simulate um, what happened to this large four-ton satellite when it actually re-entered Earth atmosphere and when it fell into the ocean. So ho hopefully we'll be able to see that and meanwhile like this video if you enjoyed it subscribe if you haven't and also post a comment what do you think uh, was uss true intention why did they keep this project such in so much secrecy why did they actually tell all the engineers that this was just a test launch do you think there was something else going on in there i think there was but who knows and as i'm actually positioning myself for the final maneuver you can kind of see my vernier engines activating trying to uh, improve my positioning here. And let's initiate our engines. We're going to burn a little bit more so that we can actually re-enter atmosphere. And now let's watch this beautiful rocket fall back onto the planet. Goodbye, Project SCORE, and thank you for an amazing Christmas message. Thank you guys for watching, game you later, bye bye.